A continuación daremos paso a la exposición denominada Prevención del Suicidio, un método basado en evidencia. Esta experiencia es fruto del trabajo del de Instituto Cero Suicidio. Este instituto busca transformar la manera en que los sistemas de salud atienden a las personas con pensamientos e impulsos suicidas. Se encuentra en 43 estados de Estados Unidos y se ha desplegado en conjunción con los sistemas estatales de atención en salud. Este modelo busca cambiar también la cultura acerca de la prevención, la detección de riesgo suicida, promoviendo acciones comunes en todo el sistema, centradas en la seguridad y en la recuperación de los pacientes. Julie Goldstein es doctora en psicología clínica por la Universidad George Washington, vicepresidenta de la Estrategia de Prevención del Suicidio y directora del Instituto Cero Suicidio en el Centro de Desarrollo Educativo. Adelante, Julie. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much for having me here. There's nothing like going last uh, in a long day. Thank you for sticking it out and staying, uh, even though my presentation is in English. Uh, and you know what? I feel very inspired. I've learned so much today already, and have been sending notes home to our my colleagues about things that I didn't know about. Uruguay's clearly uh, you've done a lot in the last couple of years, and it's incredibly impressive. So I, I look forward to learning more. Um, I work for the Education Development Center. It's a global nonprofit. We work worldwide in health and education, economic opportunity, and um, suicide and mental health uh, is a large part of our focus. So I'm going to talk a little bit about culture change and, you know, respectfully, a lot of what I'm going to say is applicable in the United States. And if I, I hope it's applicable here, or at least there'll be some nuggets uh, about what I say today. I do know even in the United States, we have so many cultures. We have an entire indigenous population, American Indian, Alaska Natives. We have veterans. We have youth. We have elderly We have very rural frontier areas, urban areas, just to name a few. Um, and so we really know that the ways that we talk about suicide and mental health are going to impact the outcomes that we hope to achieve. And this is true day to day, how, how we talk to one another, how we interact, how we talk about our challenges and our differences, um, but particularly how we talk about those we serve really matters. Um, each person's own experience is going to impact what they think about mental health prevention, suicide prevention. People are coming to the table with their values, their practices, their customs, their courtesies, particular rituals, different roles and responsibilities across the system. And it's very important that you understand this about each target audience that you're trying to reduce suicide in and not come in with a one size fits all approach. There's, it's in the United States, we have to adapt our models. Um, and we actually have to do a lot of legwork to really understand who we're trying to serve and what is unique. Kids most definitely have their own language and their own culture. I think as we were talking about today, it's hard to keep up. I have uh two teenage daughters in my house and just even knowing which electronic platform you know which social media platform matters that they want to be on where do they get in their information no sooner do i download it to try to learn about it then they're on to the next thing um so again i just really hope that you will you will take the moment to learn about culture and the other thing within culture change that we really have to think about is language And the language when we talk about suicide and suicide prevention also really matters and has an incredibly deep impact on how we think about suicide and how people at risk think about suicide. So I don't, I'm not looking to embarrass people. Um, I've heard the word commit suicide a lot today, but that's through my English translation. Um, but it is something in the United States over the last many years, we've really moved away from saying committed suicide. We say things like somebody died by suicide, died of suicide, they killed themselves. Um, and that's because, at least in the United States, when we talk about committing something, we often uh, relate that to committing a crime, which is illegal, it's horrible, it really has a bad connotation of a person doing something very negative. And suicide is not a crime. It may have been once upon a time in many of our countries, but it is not a crime today. 
And we don't want people who are at risk for suicide or particularly their loved ones who are survivors of their loved one's suicide to feel that their loved ones committed um, an act. So another example is people do engage in high risk behaviors and sometimes we say they're being manipulative or they're attention seeking. Um, it can be very exhausting. I, I'm trained as a clinical psychologist. It can be very exhausting to work with people at risk for suicide. Um, it, it is very hard work, but I think the message is that people, when they're talking about suicide are in considerable distress. And every time we have to take their, their thoughts of suicide seriously, uh, you know, it's not on us to determine is this attention seeking or is this suicide? If it is attention seeking, somebody's telling us they need attention and that the only way they can get that attention is by expressing their deep thoughts of suicide. They're telling us to wake up and hear me and see me. So these there, there's a list of the ways in which we've really um, modified our language to be very careful about how we discuss suicide because it matters and how we think about it and how people around us think about it. Um, earlier today, somebody was talking about the media presence that's here. So I also wanted to acknowledge how the media talks about suicide is incredibly important. That's how most of us get our news. And if if suicide, if the details about how somebody died, a celebrity dies, right? And, you, and people read that and think, well, they had it all and they killed themselves anyway. What, what do I possibly have? Um, we know suicide suicides did go up, calls to the United States suicide hotline went up in the wake of uh, Robin Williams' death a few years ago, Kate Spade, Anthony Bourdain, these are sort of icons in, in America. Um, so how the media reports on suicide is important. We have a website, it's reportingonsuicide.org. And I think it's probably pretty applicable. We really encourage reporters do not discuss the details of the death, right? It's okay to say that somebody died, but, but within that, we also really want to acknowledge that most people who think about suicide do not go on to die by suicide. There are many, many more people who have had thoughts of suicide than who ultimately die by suicide. It's critical that we really enforce stories of hope and recovery and where to get help so that people reading that feel that they can see themselves in that and that they have a way forward. Um, I'll, I'll do my public service announcement here too, which is I thought that somebody asked earlier about what you should do and say um, if somebody close to you is thinking of suicide. First of all, I thought the kids did a great answer. So kind of you don't need me, but um, I'm here. So I'll answer anyway. And that is, you have to take, I already said you have to take it seriously, but you also have to be very direct. If you're concerned about somebody, then you say, are you thinking about killing yourself? Are things so bad that you're actually telling me that you're considering suicide? I really want to understand. I really want to, for you to share. I really want to be able to be there and help you and be genuine and be empathic and don't judge. Whatever it is that the person came to you with, probably um, it was very brave of them to tell you. They may have told others in the past who didn't believe them or kind of accused them of being attention seeking or responded, particularly with kids. I think we look at their lives through our 50 something lens and we say, you know, you have so much to look forward to. That's your first breakup. Or why would you kill yourself over that? Right. We kind of have this knee jerk reaction to say things that is not very empathic. It's very judgmental. Um, it can be shaming and it shuts down the conversation. Um, or we say things like, don't do something stupid, right? You would never do anything crazy, right? And so again, what you're saying is, um, I, I can't hear it when you tell me that. I'm too afraid or I don't know what to do. I'm not your person. And so if we say things like that, we're ending conversations. So I really encourage you just, you know, just like if you were worried about a child with a medical issue, you're getting a lot of headaches. Tell me about that. Uh, you know, we have to be very calm and straightforward. You're really talking about some things today and I want to understand it better. Is it so bad that you're actually telling me you're thinking about killing yourself? Um, and then offer to get help, go with them, check up on them. Did they go? How is it? What more do they need from you? How can I help you? Go to the appointment with them. The kids can go to the, talk to, I'll go to a parent with you or a different trusted adult. Um, I just wanted to, answer that question that came up this morning. So public service announcement over.
Okay, so I'm going to talk about comprehensive approaches um, to suicide prevention. I will talk about zero suicide, but I also, this came up this morning, and so I really do want to reiterate that um, comprehensive approaches are critical and there, because there's no single approach that's going to reduce suicide. We can't just sort of say, I'll just do an awareness campaign, or I'll just do a screening day, or I'll just do a walkathon. Those aren't sufficient. Andrea spoke earlier this morning about the social ecological model, and you'll see how pieces of that are really woven into the comprehensive approaches that I'm going to speak about, right? We have to be at the macro level with laws and policies and practices that are really people are held, systems are held accountable for that are baked in. Um, and we have to have data to measure, are we doing what we say we're doing? We have to have strategies that are aimed at the regional level, the community level, the local level, the family level, the individual level, all of these, excuse me, all of these together uh, wrap up into a comprehensive approach. I, she mentioned this morning how the use of pesticides, that, that removing access to pesticides in Korea reduced suicide. So that's such an example of something. It wasn't really even targeted uh, directly at the people at risk. It was a kind of a very macro level policy that ultimately impacted change. Another example is in Israel, there's mandatory army service post high school. So kids 18 entered the military um, for three years and they were had many suicides. They did not allow the um, uh, those serving in the military to take their, their weapons home over the weekend. So just simply by removing access to lethal means, having ac access to a gun is incredibly lethal, they reduced suicide by 40% in that country. So we have to think creatively and not always at sort of awareness campaigns or screening days. So this is how a comprehensive approach looks. It's just one example. Um, it really is each of these pieces together. It's based on research of effective interventions and what works, particularly key uh, risk and protective factors. All of these strategies have to work in sync together. Um, as I said, it doesn't mean we just do something in every box and that's our comprehensive approach. We really have to think about how does the approach uh, how does it work in the community that we're trying to work with? Which is the right program? It's essentially a menu of options in each category. It still isn't the manual that you pull off the shelf and say, you know, I do A plus B plus C, but it is really thinking about within each of these boxes, what is my options for the community I'm working in, for the outcomes I want to see, and how do these then sync together? So there are many different ways to achieve the goals that you're looking for. Uh, the World Health Organization produced this document in 2014 on the left called Preventing Suicide, a Global Imperative. This was in response to alarming global rising rates of suicide. Uh, this at the time provided a lot of information about what worked, what was happening across the world, different countries, um, and actionable steps that countries could take. At that time, many countries still had not developed a national strategy. I think Uruguay's developed their national strategy, it sounds like, in the last couple of years. Um, but what the other thing about the preventing suicide documented by the World Health Organization is that it really gave a message of hope that suicide is preventable. And that's a really key sentiment um, that there is something that we can do. They also produced this document, Preventing Suicide, a Community Engagement Toolkit. And that's a step-by-step -step, uh, toolkit for what communities can do. In the United States, we do have a national strategy. It was first released in 2002. It has since been updated in 2012. It is due to be updated again because it's 10 years later. Uh, it has come out of my organization uh, collaborating with the United States Surgeon General. And I'm, uh, spoiler alert, I'm not sure we're updating it, but the Surgeon General did actually release progress on the national strategy last year and a call to action in places that we could really advance. Um, effective, uh, effective suicide prevention really is the list of components that are on the left-hand side here. But I do think, as I said, we released our first national strategy in 2002. Uh, suicide's gone up in the United States since then. It's actually gone up significantly since then. 
So I say that not to discourage you, but to just have an awareness that, you know, life circumstances have changed across the globe, different, uh, we've all encountered many different reasons for this that I'm not really going to go into today, but it doesn't mean we give up. It means that we really hone in on what can we do? What does the data tell us? You know, we have to use our resources very um, intelligently to laser focus where we think we can have the greatest impact and, and use the components that we know work. The other thing I really want to address is we, this is a suicide and mental health um, event, and these are highly interrelated, but they're not exactly one for one. <laughs> Not everybody who dies by suicide has a mental health diagnosis. In fact, about half the people who die by suicide do not have a mental health diagnosis at the time of their death. That means that if we really think that we're just going to treat mental health as our pathway to reducing suicide, we will miss people. There are many uh, interventions at work now that are specific to suicide that have really um, evolved over the last 10, 15 years. The research is continuing to come at us uh, quickly, which is great, but we have to infuse that. And as I'll, you'll see, I'll talk about in a second, many of us were not trained in many of these strategies and, and, and have to continue to learn how to um, incorporate them. In the United States, um, you know, 12 million adults in the United States report suicidal ideation every year, 12 million people. So the other thing when we think about our strategy is not just thinking about reducing deaths, but also thinking about reducing the distress that our community's in and reducing how people, that, that sense of hopelessness that is driving people to think about suicide. We have one, and I think this is a similar statistic that one in five kids in the U.S. consider suicide. One in 11 youth in the U.S. make an attempt. I think our statistics are relatively similar to yours. Um, but again, if we, we can't focus exclusively on, re when we think about suicide prevention, it's many of the different pieces of suicide prevention, not necessarily deaths alone, although ultimately that's the outcome we want. So a comprehensive approach, regardless of what setting we're talking about, I listed off a bunch of different settings, but it really has to have strong leadership. There has to be somebody's, not just one person's passion, but it has to be supported by leadership through multi-sectoral partnerships. Data is absolutely critical in whatever program you're doing. You have to think about the unique risk and protective factors of the population you're addressing. You want to leverage existing research and, research and effective programs. You have to rigorously evaluate what you're doing. Um, lots of times people will put money in because they lost a loved one and they say, just do this. I, I really want you to host this event. And I think it's really on us to educate people when they come to us to say, this is how your money can be better spent. This is what happens anyway in the United States. We should all be so lucky that people are throwing money at us for suicide prevention and mental health. But we, it's also on us, those of us who have expertise, to really help use those resources for their greatest gain. We have to have plans for sustainability right up front. Um, we know that often when the money disappears that the, the outcomes disappear. And we have to communicate the results in clear language um, and scale them. This is one example of a comprehensive approach. It's community-led suicide prevention. The website is there, communitysuicideprevention.org. Um, again, you know, as I said, in the U.S., a lot of people have really great intents, and they say, somebody in my community died by suicide. I have to do an awareness-raising event, um, or I have to hold a walkathon, or we have to hold an event for parents. And all of those are really powerful and really incredible moments, but they're not going to have the long-term outcomes that you want. So this is seven components that really helps the community come together and figure out who in our community is taking their lives or hurting themselves? What, what are the commonalities about them? What's at the root of this problem in our community? So how might we address it? What's, what's been shown to be effective that we can implement that would have the best chance of working here? In schools, comprehensive approaches work as well. We've heard some examples. 
Um, I think when we think about school-based suicide prevention, it incorporates many of the factors that we've already talked about, key risk and protective factors, strong leadership, multi-sectoral partnerships, really important training so that uh, everybody knows what their role and responsibility is, um, and protocols that are in place in advance of a student's death. Right. We really want the school system to be mindful that suicide might happen. And therefore, what are the practices that the school plans to engage in in the event of a negative event where they can pull that out? They've trained people. Everybody's familiarized themselves with it. And it doesn't feel um, that they're just acting on emotion as opposed to acting on the protocols that they already have been trained to to utilize. So zero suicide is a framework for healthcare systems. This would be applicable for primary care or hospitals, psychiatric inpatient, uh, emergency departments, outpatient mental health, even a school-based health clinic. Uh, we've seen it used in corrections facilities, anything where there's an opportunity to provide the seven components that comprise the zero suicide framework. Because what we really wanna do is identify people at risk and then give them the highest quality of care possible and help them move towards feeling resilient and towards recovery. So what Zero Suicide does is it really thinks about helping healthcare systems determine who is at risk, whether they came into the emergency department for a sprained ankle or a kid came in for a well visit, um, we know that these are opportunities to utilize what we know works, screening, using standardized screening tools, and then pathways and protocols for those who are at higher risk. We expect, um, so the programs I was just talking about, the community approach, the, the school-based approach, all of these comprehensive approaches ultimately point to getting somebody to see a healthcare professional if somebody's determined they're at risk, right? If the parent, if the primary care doctor, if the teacher is determined that the person is at risk, they all point to funneling the individual to healthcare. So it's really important that our healthcare systems be, be resourced and trained and prepared. They are going to have to identify and care for people at risk, and they have to use the practices that we know work. Why focus on healthcare? Well, 84% of those who die by suicide have a healthcare visit in the year before their death. Not always around mental health, it could be for any reason. 92% of those who made a suicide attempt have seen a healthcare provider in the year before their death. Almost 40% of individuals who died by suicide uh, had an emergency department visit, but did not have any mental health diagnosis. 38% of individuals who made a suicide attempt saw a provider in the week before their death. Before, I'm sorry, before their attempt. These are missed opportunities. When we, interestingly, in the United States, our first national strategy in 2002 did not include health care as a target, as one of our uh, strategies, because the assumption was we'll work on all these other sectors and settings, but when we get them to health care, they're good because they know what they're doing. And as it turns out, that's not true. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, in 2012, it was updated to incorporate training for healthcare systems, a system-wide approach, really thinking about zero suicide and a competent, uh, caring workforce. So zero suicide is both an aspirational goal and a set of practices, evidence-based practices. It really starts with the core belief that suicide is preventable and it can be achieved if we standardize how we care for people at risk, apply them every time, measure that we're doing what we say we're doing, engage in continuous quality improvement, do our intended practices with fidelity and incorporate lived experience, the voice of people, um, family members who have had loved ones die or people themselves who have been through the healthcare system with their own thoughts of suicide. Zero suicide is about how the organization arranges itself to adopt the seven principles using this research to really think about how is a system, what is the system-wide transformation to ensure that there are no gaps in the system. It is not the work of individual heroic clinicians. Clinicians are doing phenomenal work and we have to do what we can to support them. But zero suicide is not about reinforcing individual clinician care. That's, a, that's one piece of it. 
but it is the training is critical, but it is really about the system transformation so that if that clinician is out or that clinician forgot to do something in the electronic medical record, other kinds of checks and balances turn on so that we there are other ways to ensure that the individual doesn't fall through the cracks. And what sets zero suicide apart then is you're starting to see is not just so much what you do, but how you do it. It's not a checklist. We don't hand over a checklist of seven elements to healthcare systems. It's not a manual. It is really thinking very critically and asking very hard questions. What, what are the biases in our healthcare system that really could maybe undermine our, our clients getting well? Do we even know who's at risk for suicide? How do we know we haven't missed somebody? What are our practices around care? What happens if somebody misses an appointment and we, we call them and then we can't find them? What additional ways can we reach out to them? So Zero Suicide bundles these practices uh, to ensure that every door is the right door at every visit, every time, so that people are getting high quality care. Leadership is really critical, as I already talked about. Leadership is incredibly important within healthcare systems. How leaders convince their staff that suicide is preventable, that the system can be transformed to do better, and that this is a sustained effort will really uh, ensure that the healthcare system achieves the goals that it wants to do. Healthcare systems have to believe that keeping their patients safe is a core responsibility of being a healthcare system, and that also includes the individuals who work in that system. Part of that, part of leadership ensures that the staff who are doing this hard work are also cared for and safe and have the skills and the training and the support to do this hard work. So I've talked about training already. We have to ensure that that people who work in systems, regardless of what their role or responsibility is, know what is expected of them, how they use every new protocol, every new tool that's been um, adopted. And also things like, how do you motivate somebody to come back to treatment? How do you describe treatment? How do you educate family about what treatment practices are? How do you help somebody really begin to adopt the idea that life is worth living and that the care that you can provide will help them to get there? So it's these are it's far more than just training somebody in in dialectical behavior therapy or in using a particular screening tool. But we do know that people are not well trained in healthcare systems. We've been doing a survey of the workforce. We have about 70,000 respondents. And we found that fewer than one third of the workforce strongly agreed that they were knowledgeable about warning signs for suicide. You can see the statistics here, um, or most fell in the agreed column, right? Fewer than half strongly agree that they have the knowledge or the confidence or the skills to screen people. Less than 50% of providers tell us that they use suicide-specific treatment approaches, and the evidence is really there that when you use suicide-specific treatment, you can reduce suicide. So I think, I think there's kind of good news and bad news here. The good news is the vast majority of people fall into the agree and the strongly agree column, and I, I think we shouldn't um, discount that. I think the bad news is most fall into the agree column and not the or lower and not the strongly agree column. I think, you know, this is who we're sending our loved ones to. This is who all of these practices that we're trying to discern who's at risk and then send them to healthcare is all aimed at healthcare can help them get better and the people we're sending them to do not feel comfortable and confident to provide this care. So I think we can, we can do better, and this is part of how we have to think about suicide prevention. We've talked a lot throughout the day about data and measurement and quality improvement. So this is a really critical part of zero suicide as well. You have to know that you're doing what you say you're doing, and you have to measure each piece of uh, this model that you're introducing. You have to know that you're doing it with fidelity, um, and you want to know what the impact of these practices are. What we're finding is zero suicide works, uh, about 65 to 75% reduction in suicide deaths in healthcare systems that fully embrace this model. It's very hard to fully embrace this model um, all at once. No, you 
shouldn't, it's, you shouldn't try to. Uh, it's too much. You're not going to do, we've seen many systems come in and say, like, we're going to have the whole model on board, you know, in six months. And that's really not feasible. Um, because as you see, we're talking a lot about sustaining and training and measuring, but it is possible to ultimately embed all of these components and those systems that do are seeing reductions. They're also seeing uh, decreases in hospitalizations, increases in quality and continuity of care, follow-up appointments, um, better thing, improvements in screening and just using those kinds of best practices, fewer inpatient hospitalizations and cost savings. I will say that uh, one of the speakers before me talked about the data that you all have access to, the real-time data, which is like mind-blowing to, to us in the United States. We absolutely don't have these data repositories that tell you what the real-time data looks like. So you all get to come to the U.S. sometime in the next year um, and share it with the powers that be there. Because it is something that, you know, in fact, what's happened a lot in the U.S. is when COVID hit us, we talked about, we knew, and I could look up on my phone how many cases of COVID were in my community that day, literally to make a decision, should I go to the grocery store? There's no reason we can't do that in suicide prevention. It's doable. You guys did that, but we just don't look at it in the same way. And as a result, our data is about 18 months behind. So we're constantly using interventions based on 18-month-old data, and that's not a fit. That's not a way to, to address suicide um, prevention. We, we're getting better, but there's a lag. So how do you, oops, how do you get started? So you definitely, data is clearly important. Um, you really have to think about, you know, who should we focus on? What is the data telling us? Where are we going to have the greatest impact? Um, where, where are we going to find our meaningful data about who's at risk? So I really, it sounds like you already have a lot of access to this. So you're sort of kind of, so you're in great shape, or at least even if you're not there yet, um, you have aspirations to get there. So I think that's fabulous. The other key considerations are really about what's feasible. So as, as I said, it is infeasible to adopt all of the seven components of zero suicide with fidelity at scale in your entire health system in six months. If you do, I really want to hear about it. But we haven't seen that in the United States. It just takes, it's hard. There's staff turnover. Frankly, it takes oftentimes new things within the electronic medical record to be able to grab it. And, you know, so it just takes a lot longer. Um, but that's okay. I think beginning to think about what's feasible. So what do you have the resources to do? What do you have the capacity to do? Where is your leadership? Who's going to be the face of this initiative? And who's going to be around that, that face of the initiative to really create a team? Who else has to be at the table to make these decisions? And are there any kind of gaps in your infrastructure or in your resources that could really serve as barriers to accomplishing this? We have a very robust toolkit uh, to help you. It's zerosuicide.com. There's a lot of resources and videos. We actually did work with Australia several years ago. Um, and so there's a series of videos that have uh, used Australian speakers about how do they do some of this work. And we've really tried to warehouse as much as we can of this initiative. It is across the globe. There's clearly a lot more work happening in the United States, but we have examples of it. And there's tremendous examples in Australia, the United Kingdom, Canada, the Netherlands, um, and now Uruguay. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at the toolkit. I am with uh, the Zero Suicide Institute. We do provide training and consultation um, about how to do this work. And there's some additional resources on the Zero Suicide Institute page, zerosuicideinstitute.com. Zero suicide and I wanted to leave you on this um, note. I thought it would be helpful to, we just did a poll in the United States and I don't know if this is applicable here, but I hope that it is. Because in the United States, uh, what we found is that eight in 10 adults in the US are eager to learn how to further help someone who may be suicidal. And that 94% of adults in the US believe that suicide can be prevented at least some of the time. 
This is a rise. This is higher than what it was the last time we did this poll. I think it's incredibly hopeful. Um, it means that the, the will to do better exists, that the public desires it and wants it. I hope the same is true here in Uruguay. And I, I look forward to watching uh, you in your journey. And I want to thank you for having me today. It's really been a pleasure.